Hello and welcome to another special episode of the Offside Musings podcast. It's my particular delight to welcome you to this episode on behalf of my co-host Emeka Onyagwa. In today's episode, we're going to be looking at the really worsening insecurity in Nigeria. This past week, the Nigerian president, uh, Muhammadu Buhari, took off to Liberia to talk to Liberians about security. At the same time this was happening, terrorists were invading Abuja, the nation's capital, and killing some security personnel. At the same time, Nigeria continues to fail to account for dozens of its citizens who were abducted in March by terrorists from a train. Nigeria is in such terrible situation that when you consider the president going to lecture another country about insecurity or security and how to address it, I can't quite decide whether to spend 40 to 45 minutes crying about the sheer absurdity of all of this or whether to spend 40 45 minutes just laughing at the comedic situation of our country ultimately i think i'm going to hold it in together and we're going to talk about insecurity in nigeria and its potence welcome Um, I mean, this week, man. I don't know if you, if if when 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 looking at all those things, like you said, it's like you just pick up and, I mean, start crying. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, crying is not, is not the only option. Um, my, you know, in a lot of ways, Nigeria will be will be so illegally funny if it wasn't the situation in the country wasn't so tragic, you know? Um, uh, on the one hand, you, you look at terrorist organizations, um, and now in Nigeria you have Boko Haram operating, you have a group called the Islamic State of West Africa province uh, operating, and, and you have a group now called as a proper noun, proper name, unknown government, you know, it's become a group in Nigeria. And they, they have transformed Nigeria into a menaced space, okay, where there is no safe spaces in the country, okay? So, um, as we said a few episodes ago, you have a situation where robbers come into Asso Rock, okay? And they burglarize the home of the chief of staff to the president. So that's this close to going into the residence of the president himself to, to steal, okay? So you have terrorists coming into Abuja, killing soldiers, killing police people. Um, you have parts of the country where to do any social function, to do weddings, um, traditional marriages, funerals, and so on, you have now to go pay off some criminal organization to buy peace. Okay, uh, to um, as it were, as an insurance against being attacked during the party, and the police are scared to step into some communities in the southeast. Uh, the military, the police uh, are absent in communities in the middle belt of the country, in the northeast of the country. So you have that you see a situation where really throughout the nation the narrative is one of the absolute 
collapse of security. At the same time that all of this is happening, um, the Nigerian president takes off to go to Liberia to talk of all subjects about how to handle insecurity. You know, I, so, I, so I don't know. I mean, it's, it's one, for me, there's a sense of disbelief, okay? You don't believe this. I mean, you say, am I caught in a kind of warp? Am I dreaming? So that's actually my default way to explain this. I say, maybe I'm dreaming, and all these ideas are, um, you know, permeating my head, and I think that is real. I think that, uh, that Buhari went to Liberia to talk about security, and I think that Nigeria is in a state of, of absolute profound tension. But perhaps Nigeria is the most peaceful, <laughs> you know, nation in the world. It's just that I don't know it yet, and you don't know it. Perhaps our president is sitting pretty in Abuja. He didn't go to lecture anybody about uh, how to handle insecurity. And um, because then if it is real that all of those things are happening, then for me, it's either to get profoundly angry, you know, unbelievably angry to the point of being unable, incapable of speech, or to just, <laughs> just laugh, you know, for one hour. Yeah, you yeah. It's 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 tough, and you know, the added the added thing is obviously being Nigerian and living out here, you get the added pressure of, you know, requests. People, you can see the frequency of the requests and the, the decrease in, you know, Niger I mean, living in New York is it's. It's one of the first top destinations for a large amount of Nigerians that come into America, for mm -hmm. instance. Or maybe 10, 7, 8 years ago, you'd have so many people come in and call you and even call you to even take you out from Nigeria. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you know, listen to no, none of that's happening. Instead, you have people, people that used to come would be even are the ones would be, that would be requesting for assistance. Yep. You know. It's it's tiring. It's 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 exasperating. It's 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 everything you can think of on the on the more sad scale. Yeah. Of, of things, um, and then you see that it's almost like you see what's happening in terms of the the bandits coming in. Um, you see the videos. They even they even that sophisticated, which is a whole other question, a whole other conversation about how the weapons are flowing in, which mm -hmm. is the the problem. That happened in Libya, which is most likely was going to end up happening in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. These guys came in and literally um, videoed themselves the way mass shooters in America have been videoing themselves. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you want to consume that kind of content, I'm pretty sure you can find it out there. I wouldn't advise you to consume that um, for the healthy for the healthiness of your mind. Mm -hmm. But you know, um, if you choose to, it's out there. You can see it. Um, you can see the sophistication. The overpowering in some in most cases yeah. of Nigerian security forces, um, and um, you know what I was maybe it's a comedy skit, Buhari um, flying off to Libya to lecture Libya on um, security. Liberia. No, oh, sorry, Liberia. Lecture Liberia on security. Um, I don't know if it's a comedy skit. I don't know if it's in the land of the blind. <laughs> <laughs> like I don't know what this is supposed to be. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's a really, I mean, I, I grew up in the nineties, man. Um, I give you this story. I grew up in the nineties and I'd, I always say I'd been to literally every state. I remember going to Gombe when it was created because somebody from my area was uh, appointed as the administrator. Then I'd been to every state from, for sure before I was 16 mm -hmm. and we went on road trips, myself and my father who had a good position in in the government at that point in time um last couple times i've gone to nigeria it's almost sacrilegious for me to say i want to go on to go like, out yeah you know it's like ah you know, like i tell the story i told the story on um this thing we did this thing you know my mind was kind of when my own mom is like i'm like yeah i'm coming to going to amobi to look for okay and i'm going here to look for my brother-in-law was actually doing a job in oka mm -hmm. 
I was going to Okat to look for my brother-in-law. Uh, my mother is looking at me like, uh, <laughs> son. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, and this wasn't any good, by the way. It's not even like, I'm, this is maybe an hour, mm. an hour and a half. About an hour. You know. An hour and um, if, if uh, you know, the roads are uh, clear, you know, from uh, Enugu to Oka, should be an hour tops. Yeah. You know? So, so, so this is... Um, uh, the, you know, the point that you were just making, um, we we have not only that the terrorists are now terrorizing Abuja, <coughs> just a few weeks ago they went into Kuje prison, which is Nigeria's premier prison, and uh, liberated hundreds of inmates, uh, most of them still... Um, uh, missing as we speak. A um, couple of months ago, they went into a church in Owo, Ondo State, and massacred uh, dozens of people. Nobody has found the culprits as we speak. In March, uh, they went in Kaduna and abducted scores of people from um, uh, a train as we speak. Uh, there is a video circulating of these terrorists in uh, somewhere in a forest just flagellating, flogging their victims. And you see men, women, and children emaciated beyond recognition, just in absolute grief and terror, crying. All right? And the Nigerian government, government officials go to bed wake up, the best response that Buhari has offered is to do a little bit of rearranging of top military, of the top military hierarchy. And there's a certain laziness because as people have pointed out, if the government, and we might as well say it, a lot of Nigerians believe that the government or government officials are complicit in the climate of terror, of insecurity that has, that currently pervades the country. Because it doesn't make sense that every Nigerian has now um, uh, what they call the, the national identity uh, number, NIN. And so every phone in the country is tied to a NIN number, all right? So the government, if it were a serious government, would know uh, through the telephone numbers of these terrorists, a lot of them demand and receive billions of naira in ransom payments. Um, so the government should know who they are. At any rate, a government with a simple interest in tracking terrorists should know their location if they made a phone call from any location, okay? It's a technology that is available. It's a technology that has been successfully used, I know, in Anambra State under former Governor Obiano. Uh, it's a technology that they got from Israel. So if you kidnapped anybody in Anambra State and you made a phone call from anywhere, even if you've taken the people, your victims out of the state, they will monitor. Even after you switched off the phone, they will still receive signals from the phone, recognize the approximate uh, location, surround it at night, and that's how ter uh, kidnappers were driven out of Anambra State for much of the tenure of Obiano. In fact, uh, the first term that Obiano uh, served as governor of Anambra State, um, there were perhaps two kidnappings and uh, both times the victims were rescued through the use of this technology. So the fact that Buhari's government has somehow not discovered the whereabouts of people who have committed huge crimes in the country, huge crimes of violence, suggests to me that perhaps government officials um, 
are embedded with the people who uh, carry out these criminal activities. Yeah, I mean, uh, um, I mean, one one key point to add is the defense budget under Buhari mm-hmm. has more than doubled. Yes, it's a statistical fact. Mm-hmm. It's more than doubled, and verifiably, it's more than gotten worse. Um, they have less equipment, less everything. Um, you name it. It's it's you know you look at it, but the air force, the distance, the the amounts allocated. Um, you've had instances in the recent past of ex service chiefs having um, so much money, cash mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. found on them. Um, you've had all that, so it 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 you know whatever it is, it definitely shows um, either somebody that is very incompetent in running anything. Um, you know, I mean, leading to his statement of, um, what did he say, the, the wife in the other room or whatever it meant. Yeah, the, the, um, the other room statement. Yeah, yeah. Is, is either a guy that is absolutely incompetent in running anything because, yeah, allocating more money, nothing to show for it. In fact, less than when you came into office. In fact, our it's a guy, it's a person who is complicit, either tactfully or by willful ignorance. Mm-hmm knowing what's happening and wanting it to happen and willfully ignorant that the, of the fact that it's happening because you want it to happen. Yeah. Um, it shows that. Um, it shows, I mean, we're going to get into, you know, even the, the spending of the government. I mean, we're talking about in a couple episodes ago that by next year, actually from the figures it's, they released. It's happening now. The, <laughs> the Nigerian government is bankrupt. Yeah, they, they, the Nigerian nation is bankrupt. Nigeria is officially borrowing money to service its debts and borrowing money to pay its recurrent expenditures. Yep, it's you can't get um, you can't get more a more failed state than this. This is a classic definition of a state that has failed. As a matter of fact, when they came into office, they had. Statistically, they had at least two point one billion dollars in their um, excess, excess crude oil account, which essentially is their savings. Really, it should was set up um, rainy day through <laughs> to be through through the um, direction of Okonjo Wala and her economic team to be the rainy day fund. And you know, people have written about it that even then, the majority of the political office holders, I think more than 80 percent, were fighting against it. At the time, Buhari came into office. It was about two point one billion, or somewhere around that. Two two point, somewhere around that. Yeah. I, I get, I'm not too sure of the figure, but I I, it, I think it's about two point one billion right now. As at the last withdrawal, I think I believe it has come down to a little over two hundred and something thousand dollars. Mm-hmm. So, it made a lot of people out here are worth more than that, or yeah. even make more than that to the year. You know, it, that it, 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 a lot of People that have gra- just graduated from or recently graduated from college are even making somewhere close to that. So you have people in countries like this or other countries who are making more money than Nigeria has in its reserves. And even that money that they have in their reserves for a country of 200 million people um, is, I mean, I mean that says it all. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, I don't know what to, it, it's, it's, and, and it's, it's in spite of the fact that the price of oil has spiked mm-hmm. to the highest it's been in, I believe, over maybe 10 years, somewhere around that, mm-hmm. in spite of the fact that they are making more money than their most optimistic projections had them making this year. Yeah. They are already in deficits. Yeah. Well, um, talking about that, and I, I like us not to lose focus on the security uh, dimension of all of this. But talking about uh, price of oil, is uh, a major, um, well, highly connected Nigerian who told me in conversation that 75% of Nigeria's oil production is stolen. You know, so which might explain the fact that as the price of crude oil continues to rise, Nigeria has little to show for it. I mean, as Governor Soludo um said at a conference a few weeks ago that basically that for several months now you know the states have got zero revenue from oil to 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 share 
and and it says something big. In a sense, it's it's all related to the security situation, because Nigeria has always had um, been run by a bunch of lazy men and a few women, mentally lazy, unimaginative, who simply depended on the fact that every month they could snooze all they want, they could sleep all they want, but at the end of the month that there is uh, a check that comes uh, their way as governors, as president, and that money will come by way of Nigeria's oil exports. And uh, so it, it, it will fall to them as governor, as president, as you know, politically connected people to simply decide uh, how best to steal all of that money, okay? Whilst investing a minuscule part of it uh, in providing for a nation, really, of a sizable population of people in the world. So most of the earnings are frittered away in, in larceny, in graft, and so on and so forth. But now, you don't have that money. And so, clearly, you can see that the future in Nigeria is going to be one of absolute breakdown of law and order. So we're seeing simply the incipient early signs of this uh, total collapse in the country because, as I said, states are not getting any money from the federal government. The internally generated revenue um, is going to continue to dwindle because if you add the rising cost of the dollar and the other foreign, uh, foreign currencies, if you add the fact that uh, power supply continues to, um, to be very, very scant with uh, rising cost of fuel uh, for running generators and so on, you see that the domestic productive sector is also going to decline precipitously, all right? At a time when the country is earning next to nothing uh, externally. And so what we're going to find is that the country will enter into bleak economic times where people are going to, the people who have jobs, a lot of them are going to lose their jobs. Uh, those who have jobs will find that the salary they earn is able to buy less and less. And it's not less and less over a matter of weeks or months. It's going to be that you can go to the market today and buy bread for uh, 500 naira. And you return tomorrow. The same loaf of bread will now be selling for 1,500. You know, um, I mean, when Americans talk about inflation, for example, I know that you know I like avocados and so on. I used to buy in some stores. I'll buy one avocado for a dollar forty cents or something. Um, and sometimes you'll find avocado for a dollar, a dollar per, per avocado. And suddenly you go and avocado is now two dollars and two dollars and change, right? Mm -hmm. In Nigeria, it is that you could get something for a hundred naira today. And in two days, you go to the same shop. The same material is now selling. That's, you got 200 naira, 100 naira, two days. It's now selling for three times, four times the cost. Okay? And so when people are suffering uh, in this way, the invitation to turn to crime becomes... Uh, stronger, and especially the fact that there are lots and lots of young people. Nigeria has a predominantly young population. There are lots of young people who sit home idle. They have received very poor education. The opportunities for them to have a fulfilled life it's disappeared. And, and yet, every human being has to eat. And um, so crime will become very, very at attractive. And we're seeing simply the early signs of all of this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, indicative to, to say that even people whose, whose only job 
um, is to ensure that they have enough to steal in terms of like making sure that um, the oil, well, the oil bunkering is, is something called legal, illegal oil bunkering, uh, official government sanctioned oil bunkering. Um, but to a large degree, even that is not, doesn't necessarily account for the bulk of the oil bunkering anymore. Um, it never did anyway. Um, because you had strong forces who under Obasanjo, um, well, <laughs> while Obasanjo was in office, and they started this steep decline. I'll al- but I'll always maintain the decline has always been there, even prior to independence. It's just we were not paying attention to it because things seemed like they were going in some direction. But under Obasanjo, you had a steep decline and a steep climb, incline for some people. Some people had a steep incline to become some of the richest and a lot of people had a steep decline. In other words, the, the lack of any middle anymore. And because of that, you had situations where you had the Niger Delta, people agitating, becoming, um, they, were, they were already wiser. It's just that under their previous leaders, a lot of them were compromised in certain ways, the Kensara Rivers, mm-hmm. and so on. Or in some ways, you could say they had their own personal agendas, which most times ended up conflicting. So you have a lot of those uh, this thing's creaking and, and, and they made a lot of noise and then they end up um, rewarded in some ways and in some ways taking over those installations. I remember Port Harcourt, as an example, used to be a much safer place prior to 1999. But I think somewhere in the t- 2000s, it became that ground, maybe you could say ground zero for um, celebrity kidnapping, um, you know, at a point in time. Um but anyway, um, so you, you have a situation where the Nigerian state um, or the people that run the Nigerian state, the people who have made it the men and the few women who have made it their sole job to be unimaginative, as you've put it, wake up in the morning and expect that check. And the only thing they have to do is to be able to pay um, for their security. In other words, use the Nigerian state, but... Um, you know, compensate them to motivate them to go out there mm-hmm. and protect the assets that they are going to, they themselves are going to eventually benefit from. Mm-hmm. They are so unimaginative, they are so berate or mentally lazy, like you've put it, that they can't even see that this is what they need to do. And if you go back historically, that has always been the problem a big problem in a lot of um, empires, big and small. Mm-hmm. Um, empires, countries, you go back and look at recent history, um, how some of them have survived. You go back to Angola, for instance, the Jonas Sabinvi, um, uh, the rising the police to survive. You go back to a lot of places like the Gaddafis and so on. You go back to even Rome, uh, the battles between um, uh, um, um, Caesar's um, successors, you know, um, Mark Anthony, um, uh, well, well, what they call him would call himself Little Caesar as well. Um, those battles, you would see a large part of, even though um, Mark Anthony was, um, not a, a little bit of tangent anyway, even though Mark Anthony was, had more power, more, this thing, more public support, they end up losing to, um, um, not Nero. Um, anyway, they end up losing to Caesar's appointed successor. At that point in time, um, what's in his name? But primarily because they didn't, they couldn't, like every other distance, whether it's Angola, whether it's the current situation in Nigeria, even the lazy people, mentally lazy people cannot see how much um, you, you, you need to be able to carry along a large segment of your population. Yeah, there's, there's a name for it. It's called uh, enlightened self-interest. Exactly. You know, so every... Even the most um, class stratified society has leaders. Uh, even when an emperor is running a um, a space, the emperor recognizes that to some degree you have to keep your subjects minimally happy. Okay, uh, and that means making sure that they are well-fed, even if they lack everything else, that at least they have food, maybe not well-fed, but that they have food to eat. When you have a situation, which is what we have in Nigeria, where uh, over decades, from the late 
1950s to now, we've generated hundreds of billions of dollars uh, in oil revenue that could have given us a world-class infrastructure. So Nigeria has no reason not to be as materially developed as, say, in Malaysia or, or Turkey, for example, um, because we've made that money. But what's happened is that all of that wealth that we generated has been stolen. And it's been stolen by men and, again, a few women who continue not to face, who have never faced, and as we speak, don't seem about to face any legal sanction. So, you know, Nigeria uh, attracts the mindless kind of embezzler of, of thief. And yet, in our mind, we have made it, you know, impossible to contemplate the fact that an ex-head of state can be jailed that a governor can be jailed. And I know people are going to respond and say, well, there are some governors who are in jail currently. But if you consider the number of governors who have committed crimes of graft and of uh, the theft of public funds in Nigeria, which is like, I'm sure it's 90-something percent of the governors who have ever run any state in Nigeria have stolen the resources of their state to an egregious degree. But... Only one or two of them, Joshua, Darye, you know, um, what's the other guy from Plateau State? Um, so we don't punish our criminals, our worst criminals. We punish the, the young man, the small person who picks a pocket because he's desperate and hungry, right? So if, in fact, if he's lucky, we send him or her to jail. Often they are burnt, they are, you know, mobbed and killed and set on fire. Enlightened self-interest. I often like to compare Nigeria to the Philippines. Um, I, I was fortunate to be in the Philippines like three times with my family because my, um, my brother-in-law lived there for, for more than 10 years. And the first time I visited, what I found out was that there were similarities between the political and social elite in the Philippines and the political and social elite in Nigeria. Those similarities consisted in a certain obsession, fascination with material things. You know, so the Filipino uh, elite like nice, expensive cars, what Nigerians call exotic cars. Uh, they are Rolls Royces, they are Bentleys, they are Mercedes Benzes, um, and so on. They like massive, uh, plushy homes. But what they have then done is, because they like those cars, they have provided excellent roads comparable to roads you'll find in the United States and in the wealthier countries in Europe, in their country. So they, they, they can enjoy the cars they bought. Mm -hmm. And because they like huge mansions, they ensure that there is regular, uninterrupted power supply. So you have electricity, you don't have that uh, dissonant sound of generators all over the place uh, in Nigeria when you are in, uh, in an upscale, uh, wealthy neighborhood in Nigeria. And then Filipinos have given themselves an excellent healthcare system. I know... Uh, Two relatives of mine actually were treated or did their annual physical exams in the Philippines. And they commented on the rigor, on the sophisticated equipment, impressive sophisticated equipment that the hospitals and doctors had there in the Philippines that were comparable, if not superior, to those that we encounter in America. And yet Nigeria is a country where because our politicians lack this, what we call enlightened self-interest, mm -hmm. they like to buy Rolls Royces, but then they don't pay attention to constructing the road so that their cars will enjoy, so that they themselves will enjoy uh, maximally from the comfort 
uh, from the uh, extra um, um, uh, features of these expensive cars. They build massive homes, but then they have to provide water to it through digging boreholes for themselves. And often you see that the toilets are discolored because of the quality, the untreated qual uh, quality of the water. And of course, no local government councillor in Nigeria, much less a governor, and of course, forget the president, would submit him or herself to be treated in a Nigerian hospital. And yet they talk of a great game. They talk about, I have totally transformed my state or my local government and so on. And when they are sick, you say, go to a state hospital to get treated. No, they ask for their passport. You know, I mean, so they refrain, the uh, former governor of Anambra State, um, Willie Obiano, for example, has just returned to Nigeria after receiving um, a compassionate release uh, of his passport um, from the EFCC to enable him to come to America to receive, I believe, treatment from whatever his ailment is, right? It happened some years ago when Ibori, former governor James Ibori, um, was touting himself as having transformed Delta State over eight years. And then once he was arrested by the EFCC, he asked for his passport to be returned to him so that he could go abroad for medical treatment. And I said, if you transformed your state, then you should have hospitals in your state that are totally that you've totally transformed, that should be superior to the hospitals in England, or in the United States, or in Dubai, or in South Africa, where ultimately they go for treatment. Um, so that's the particular crisis, I think, of of the Nigerian ruling elite. That's yeah. You know this absence of um, of of enlightened self-interest, yeah, which was. brings me to the question of the response of the National Assembly. Some uh, senators have asked for Buhari to resign or be impeached. Yeah, and, I, uh, I wanted to and, say, and they've given him yeah. six weeks yeah. to solve the problem. What do you think? Yeah, I was going. I was going. That's a good segue to go into that. But as you were talking about the Philippines story, I remember something that happened um, the last couple of years. I was in secondary school in Nigeria. I had a friend. Just quickly, I had a friend who whose father, at that point in time, had a little airline or little, you know, helicopter service Private in the UK, yeah. mm -hmm. and. I think the guy was, you know, more of a frugal person. And at that point in time, he had a house somewhere in a not-too-good area of Ikeja. Mm -hmm. So his kids, he had two sons. His kids loved, um, well, he had more than, he had two sons from this wife, anyway. Um, his kids, like, loved driving then in secondary school. Mm -hmm. um, but he wouldn't let them drive because they were kind of reckless. But the main thing is that Nigeria was very reckless. Mm -hmm. So because he was a little bit of a frugal guy, he bought a house in somewhere where he had a lot more land so he would let his kids drive the Dewu Racer. It was a Dewu Racer and other car. But they would only drive it inside the compound. Yes. <laughs> there was nowhere to go outside the place. <laughs> Literally. These are still my friends, man, yeah. till tomorrow. So uh, it's a very real and interesting story. But, you know, just like you said, um, you know, segueing to um, um, what happened this week, coming in from last week, mm -hmm. where, you know, the Nigerian National Assembly comes out and and you know why they a bunch uh, of a bunch of senators you know yeah it, it, it it's you know um it's obviously some people who a couple months mostly the minority senators by the way senators not from the, the ruling party mm -hmm. a, a whole bunch of people who should have been saying more years ago mm -hmm. are not saying anything we're not saying anything then and all of a sudden want to wake up and you know normally we'll say uh, you know, it's better to be, um, I think the Igbo proverb is, when, to translate from Igbo, when somebody wakes, is that person's money. Is that person's money. <laughs> so, so I typically would say that, but uh, in my opinion, I, I'd, I'd sit down and I think it's just a, a, a waking up to just the part that um, their self-preservation. And what do I mean by that? We just spoke about it in this then. 
the country is bankrupt. Mm -hmm. These are people who over the years have made themselves the highest paid people, um, highest paid legislators in the, know, world. in the world. Um, and obviously, you now have a country, like we said, that is <laughs> unable to meet basic obligations. So what are you likely having? You're having people borrowing money. Um, whoever is going to come in is going to start looking for how to restructure whatever debts they have. And as as is with these debts, with these um, borrowings, these lending, so what, you know, whichever borrowing, lending, um, in this case, they are lending. They're they borrowing. They are borrowing. The lender is giving you right out, yeah. So in this case, they are borrowing, as, as is with the lenders. Mm -hmm. International lenders tend to have conditions depends on where you borrow from if it's the chinese they might want to take over your yeah, assets yeah, completely yeah. your country most likely they, they, you've seen them try to do that if it's the imf or the world bank they're going to come in with conditions you know, uh, policies and uh, conditions I mean, and yeah. you can almost pretty much you don't you don't need to be a, any kind of economic guru to see that the world nobody's going to listen to anything you do Without one, a commitment to corruption, but two, a reduction in salaries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nobody's going to borrow your money so you could give a Nigerian send into one point something million dollars a year in between salaries, and mm -hmm. nobody's going to do that. Um, they might, you might see that being done for corporations in America in terms of oh, stock buyback mm -hmm. or um, CEO compensations, mm -hmm. which people will try. Some depends on how the the government, you know. Um, this thing, but that's it. That's those are corporations, those are within governments, those are within society, those are trying to keep this thing, those are trying to keep industries alive. For a country, you're not going to see somebody come except they have ulterior motives to give you money and then take over. Oh, we're going to give you this money, but we're going to take over your um oil exp exploration. It reminds me of um uh for those who watch football, it would be a good analogy for you if you don't. All the apologies. What's happening with uh, Barcelona right now? Um, where they are, the only they are bankrupt. They are broke. They don't know what to do, but somehow, some way, they have money to um, spend. And part of the deal of having money to spend is because they've mortgaged their future earnings, twenty five percent of their image rights and everything for I don't even I don't even I think I don't even know if it's with perpetuity or the next twenty five years. They've they've mortgaged their future to try and compete in the present. Instead of looking for a different structure in this thing, that would be most like the most likely scenario. Um, for those who understand an analogy, you know, big ups. But that would be the most likely scenario for Nigeria, where um, you're going to have borrowers that would come in and be like, "All right, we're going to get." You mean lenders? Lenders, rather. I keep intertwining them. Um, you shouldn't be in all that. You, well, you shouldn't be. I mean, if you Christianity doesn't, but prior to this thing, didn't real Christianity, Islam doesn't. Um, uh, believe either um, in um, um, interest lending, but you're going to have people who are going to go in and are going to be like, "We're going to let, we're going to be your lenders, but we're going to extract, extract a, a pound stringent. of flesh." Yeah. yeah, or you're going to have people who will be like, and, and it's going to be in one way or the other. Um, IMF historically, you go back to the reason why they kicked out Buhari in the first place. It's kind of ironic. Mm -hmm. Um, if you go back to the newspaper articles from back then, you will see Buhari's government in 1984 was terrible. Should never be. We should never have have this again. And then Buhari comes up, you know, after the coup. I believe it was December 20th, 1985. December 20th, I believe. Maybe December this then 1985. Buhari lists the fact that Buhari didn't negotiate with the IMF. That's why they kicked him out. And then when they go in, they go in with Carlo Di Cacalo. They go to negotiate, and most people call the SAP, what the IMF had prescribed for Nigeria, when in reality, mm -hmm. the SAP, that was what they call SAP, mm -hmm. or the Structural Adjustment Program, in its full name, was actually a lot more draconian than what even the World Bank wanted. Mm -hmm. Because the Bangladesh regime was, I mean, faced with this thing, and they were there to perpetuate themselves. So they rather, they inflicted the pain on society in the calculation that they were going to keep the segment of the society they wanted on their side. Some of the elites, not all, because a lot of people drop from, from middle class to nowhere or reach to this thing. And the military and the law enforcement, so they had the bangi that gives officers and even the enlisted were getting um, allocations for, well, money for to buy land, motorcycles. In the case of this thing, it was brand officers, brand new Peugeot 504s, and so on and so forth. 
But for the rest of the population, people dropped. Like it was like things you've heard about maybe in the Zimbabwe or this thing. The money just went from um, being stronger than the dollar to, I think it was, I've forgotten what it was, 10, 10 naira or something like that. So that's what they see coming down the pike. And that is where they all of a sudden, their self, their level of self-preservation, in my opinion, has come in like, oh, this is what's going to happen. We, to be a legislator is probably going to be unprofitable because nobody's going to, you know, it's going, we are going to feel the pinch. Yeah. So let's look and for anything yeah, to save ourselves. And it's, it's yeah, so talking about uh, self-preservation, which clearly plays into it, into the entire politics of um, uh, senators and some members of the House of Reps calling for Buhari's um, um, uh, resignation or impeachment and uh, giving um, an ultimatum of, of six weeks to address the problems of insecurity in the country. There is also, apart from the financial scenario that you just pointed out, there is also the fact that the walls of insecurity are closing in on everybody. So it used to be that these uh, big men in Nigeria and uh, their cronies who you know, drive around Nigeria and uh, sort of enjoy little pockets of security because they could have uh, police convoys, they could have uh, uh, civil defense, they could have even military uh, people in their convoys. But the terrorists in the country, the militants in the country, are as well armed, if not better <laughs> armed, than the Nigerian police and often the Nigerian army. And they have taken, in many cases, to attacking security and law enforcement personnel in the country. And so it's no longer safe for the country's uh, well-to-do to parade around the space with uh, this spectacular display of their convoys because the president, a, an advanced convoy of the president, the Nigerian president. Okay. Let me get this better for you. So you can. Oh. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Why did you wait till? <laughs> I thought you preferred it like this because I know you have media training. You know, you don't like to talk into a mic. Mm. So, but there's some mics in general. You know, I, I'm a print journalist. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not good at yeah. like you are back in the day was a print journalist that yeah. up on TV. All right. This thing. Okay. Oh boy. Ooh. All right. Okay. okay. So, you know, um are we are we all set? Yeah. So you know, so so you have a situation now where the walls of insecurity are closing in on everybody, and you can no longer count on the police uh, to protect you. You can't count on the uh, on soldiers to protect you, and the terrorists are taking the battle to the Nigerian state right in Abuja. Okay, they are invading overtaking uh, the prison, the biggest prison, the most important prison in Nigeria, Kuje prison. They are committing uh, burglary and theft within Aso Rock. It's like, guys, it's like armed robbers and burglars invading the White House or 10 Downing Street to steal from the president's or the prime minister's chief of staff who happens to live within the premises, you can't get more dysfunctional and more ab ab abysmal than that, okay? So I think that these legislators are beginning to see that there is no hiding place for them, okay? The error of them feeling that they inhabited these bubbles of security and enclaves of comfort, that whole idea 
is 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 collapsed. But also, uh, it's it's there's a self-serving agenda here because they want to blame President Buhari. Of course, Buhari has been a disaster. Somebody like Buhari should never have been president of Nigeria. And when you think about it, most of those who have run the country, Nigeria, should never, in uh, in a more self-respecting nations, should not even aspire to be presidents of their town unions, much less state governors, much less presidents. That's true of most of the people who have been president in Nigeria. But Buhari is a particularly it's a particularly terrible case of a man who was ill-equipped intellectually and physically to take on the rigors of statecraft. And here we have this man becomes the president of the most complex nation in Africa and has done expectedly a disastrous job. I remember telling an interviewer uh, before Buhari's election that Buhari was likely to prove a dud. And I was attacked <laughs> left and right. You know, somebody wrote a piece and said uh, the annoying distraction called Okendibe and pilloried me and so on. So none of this is a surprise to me, okay? But the attempt by the senators to particularize Buhari as the um, sort of the architect of the state of anomie that we are in is, is blinkered, okay? The legislators, so I, I was thinking the other day, I said, what has... Uh, what have members of the National Assembly done in 23 years um, of the National Assembly under this current, what, they call, what we began by calling the nascent democracy? What have they done? What laws did they initiate and pass? How have they um, addressed any serious social, political, or economic problem in Nigeria so that we can say, we can point to a particular initiative, a particular law and say that this changed the lives of Nigerians for the better. For all that money that we have poured into maintaining this uh, legislative arm in the government. And I c can't find one thing. I can't find Sadly, one. Sadly, I was, uh, well, I mean, you take it for what it is. I was listening to, um, I was listening to a bunch of, um, um, what I call them, the um, um, surrogates mm -hmm. for the campaigns. Yes. And the, the ones for uh, Atiku. Yes. They asked him that sort of question, that you were there for eight years, what did you do? What did you do? And um, some of the surrogates were like, um, Atiku and brought in a phone, cell, cell phones, yeah, and uh, can you imagine that? And remember that Atiku was in the first time of that uh, of Basanja administration. Atiku was essentially, if not the superior political leader in that administration, at least uh, uh, coeval, yeah, uh, equal to yeah. Basanja. Yeah, people said that, the, said that. It was in the second time that Basanja sort of marginalized him. So you say they. Um, the privatization of, of businesses were, uh, was done under Atiku. What was the result of it? Um, all the investment in power, okay? Uh, $16 billion spent in the power sector, and Nigeria has nothing to, uh, to, 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 uh, nothing to account for it. And the point that you made about you know, the country's debtors or lenders, you know, um, imposing perhaps uh, extremely stringent conditions if they are going to uh, re reconfigure uh, the country's debt. The larger conversation is all that money that Nigeria has borrowed under all kinds of governments, including the present one. What is the 
how was that money invested? So why are we paying for money that was borrowed by our leadership and we haven't seen the uh, effects of their investment, but every Nigerian is suffering because the country is now caught in this vice of paying for things, perhaps money that was stolen. Another response I've seen to that conversation is um, they say one of the dividends of the borrowing, mm -hmm. <laughs> one of the dividends, <laughs> I mean, at this point, it's hard to say some of these things with even a straight face, yeah. is that um, Nigeria has full subsidy, yeah. like most of us know. Yeah. They said the lower price, because Nigeria has the lowest price of fuel within um, um, that region, which also <laughs> leads to forced casting because people just literally just divert so it to send other countries. It across the borders. They say the fuel subsidy, it's a dividend of the leadership mm -hmm. of the country yeah. to Nigerians. Yeah. The Nigerians have the opportunity when they see fuel to pay. <laughs> so, so the, of course, the response is, that the political leadership in the country destroyed the country's refineries, all of them. So that Nigeria has been caught in this cycle of importing fuel that is refined outside of the country. And sometimes the quality of the fuel that is imported, it's uh, been so bad in some situations that it's had to be thrown away, right? So... The countries, we've been just so... And that, that happened even a couple of months ago yeah. as well. Yeah, we've been so unfortunate under uh, our ruling elite that they are so... You know, John Bunyan, the, uh, the, 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 the English writer, uh, in one book said that the black man, that the white man will continue to rule the world as long as the black man lives only for his gut, for his stomach. And Nigeria epitomizes this ethic of leaders who live for their stomach. You know, leaders who like to go to Dubai with their children and with their families and show off, want to send their children to schools in America and, and England and elsewhere in the world and go to their graduations and show off. And you don't recognize, puny as they are, that it is men and women like you who created those systems that you like to bask in. And that you can also, with a little bit of imagination, with self-restraint and discipline, that you could actually turn Nigeria, your country, into a space where other people would want to send their children to go to schools. So, but for me, so, yes, Buhari should be held to account. I wish Buhari left the presidency like seven years ago. I, I, I wish okay. he left the first I, week he came. I, I, I wish he was <laughs> never put in there to start with. Mm -hmm. But it is what it is, as they say. But the members of the National Assembly who are now trying to be self-righteous and all, um, you know, as if they are holding the president to account, should know that they themselves have been part and remain part of the party. And, but more to the point for me is what does it all mean? Mm -hmm. I think that all of this points to the absolute collapse of Nigeria as an idea, okay? Nigeria has been emptied of meaning. And this has been going on for a long time. We are, we are seeing sort of the culmination of decades of this progression to meaninglessness. So, again, for me, it makes the point that we've made on this podcast over and over again, that the whole idea of holding elections in 2023 is nonsensical. It is stable societies that can contemplate elections, can contemplate the transition from one set of leaders to another set of leaders. When you have a state that is absolutely bankrupt of meaning what you should do is to say how can we create a sense of normalcy and so Nigeria is in, a, in an emergency situation Nigeria is critical so it's like the way I look at it is if you have a patient in the hospital or let's put it this way if I wake up one day 
and I have a headache, okay? But you want to take me out to lunch. You could say to me, okay, all right, take a um, pop, a couple of painkillers, and we'll go to lunch at one. If I have a stroke or a heart attack, okay, and I'm lying comatose in the hospital, you can't say to me, hey, okay, we're going to lunch at one. Nigeria is in a comatose situation. So we can't be talking to talk about the elections is like saying, let's go to lunch. Okay? We should say, how can we revive this organism, Nigeria, which is broken? How can we revive the country? Is there a shot at reviving the country? If there is, let's get the best doctors, which is what I call a panel of experts from different fields, to revive this comatose patient, only when the patient is now revived and out of the hospital can we contemplate, let's go to lunch. Let's have an election. You don't have an election when there is no meaning in the space. When terrorists can overwhelm the most guarded prison in the country, when they can invade the president's residence, when they can take people from a train station and hold them for months, when a country's students have been home for five months, not one day of classes because lecturers are on strike and the government is not addressing it, when terrorists can walk into a church and kill scores of people and nobody knows who they are, when there are parts of Nigeria that are no-go areas for soldiers and police, when there are sectors in the country where you have to pay off criminals in order to hold a party. It means there is no nation there. There is no reason to contemplate next year's election. That's, that's the bottom line. Um, it's, it's one more a reminder that our rush to hope hold the elections um, I mean I don't hold out hope that I'm go we're going to stop anybody but I want to be on record that I, w I you know for warning Nigerians that you know uh, you, you don't you don't have uh, you don't have a, 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 a you don't hold an election over who will preside over a cemetery <laughs> Nigeria, Nigeria is is no better than a cemetery at the moment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's. Um, I mean, the other thing you've also, as well said, it's um, no single one of the candidates, um, whether the, the leading candidates or the the guys in the, in the, in the uh, somewhere well below who have no chance of winning anything, uh, or the guys that are just there, the people that are just there to rubber rouse them, in my opinion. Nobody has addressed, addressed it. No. no single person has woken up to be like, mm -hmm. all right, this is how they see a road map. I mean, maybe it's smart politics on some people's part because who knows what their prescription might be. If we go back to the history of Nigeria, if we go back to the Gideon Okaku who came into the coup uh, two weeks before the coup, I think, or less than. He was drafted in, you know, he came in with all the energy. Uh, which is the reason why he also got caught, by the way, because one of the reasons he didn't have an escape plan. So all the coup plotters and their financier, Greg Ubur, all had um, their golden parachutes. Yes. Everybody, <laughs> you know, uh, I think it's Connolly Yam. I think he still lives in that, Texas, actually. Mm -hmm. All those guys had their, they, they, were, they were all on point um, after years of an experience of uh, this thing. So they draft, the, you know, of, of what happens in coups, how bloody it gets, how... This thing, you know, so they, they bring in, and his first port of call was to say what he wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I like or not like, that's a whole other conversation. But I don't, I think it's a, it was a legitimate, I mean, if we look back, legitimate, he had legitimate concerns. Um, I say that in summary, but you know, that's, that's not part of this conversation. But he gave his prescription, and that led to the end of the coup. Pretty That's much. That's right. Um, <laughs> let's so maybe somebody, one of these guys has you know, a prescription. I, I, I highly doubt it anyway. Mm -hmm. A prescription for war, of how they want to build or how, how they want to, how this is the moment mm -hmm. that they want to seize mm -hmm. to create what sh 
is or should be a nation. Yeah. Uh, you know, the beginnings of a nation of some yeah. sort. You know, I was talking about this in the moment uh, before. Um, he, uh, Julius Caesar mm-hmm. and um, Augustus, who he appointed, you know, go, no need to go into the deep, the distance of how he, of how he appointed him, the fact that he wasn't a biological child, um, Caesarus apparently was, and all that stuff. But the point is, that was the key. That was the key to um, the difference between uh, what people don't t- tend to drive some people nuts. But it, it's what is the Roman Empire, Roman Republic, and what now becomes the Roman Empire. Mm-hmm. Somebody saw things in a different way when they t- when they took over. It's always possible for somebody to come in, and I've always said you need somebody. We've we've had that conversation. Somebody who is either a strong man of some sort, or somebody who has the strong will of the people to walk in there, as we've seen in to some cases disastrous effects in modern day modern day policy and modern day history. People like um, uh, Hugo Chavez, mm. people like and you know, I'm not arguing about how Venezuela has gone from mm. the country with the large. I'm not that, you know that. Could argue about that. Yeah, at, the, at the end of the day, you came in and you said you're going to make life life better for your people, and on the whole, he didn't. That's just facts. Why that happens different. People like um, 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 what they call him in Cuba, um, Fidel, Castro. Fidel Castro, who came in with the popular will, riding in with the popular will, um, largely to. You know, it depends on which side of the aisle you are on, but largely a lot of people would say it's not good effects. People like uh, Rollins, who got broken out on this thing, and some people would say to better effects because it could have been a lot worse mm-hmm. than what it is in Ghana. So you've had a lot of people who have come in, and you have the situation in um, in uh, Ethiopia where it's it's still an ongoing thing. Abi Ahmed came in with low popular support, and um, it's no longer there. But you've had people who have had popular, uh, the will of their people. You go to Sheikh in Dubai, one of your favorite examples, or one of a lot of people, not just yours, their favorite examples, um, who came in and had a lot of popular support and have been, and still enjoy mm-hmm. a level, a high level of popular support. Um, the, the leaders of, of Dubai, of, of, of Qatar, um, they still enjoy a lot of popular support. Um, in some cases, you just had people who are, uh, strong men who have come in and shaped society. The pro- the thing is, none of the people running have had a prescription for how they want it. This thing again, it's possible they do have it. Um, but is that are we trying to leave things to chance that somebody's uh, <laughs> somebody might be that human? This this yeah, that's why I, I call I tend to call, are we trying to look for a savior mm. or are we trying to be part? Are we are we going to sit down and be like, look, we need to have something else to have this mm-hmm. an environment that we could call a nation? Yeah. Are we going to be that, or we're just going to be like, well, you know, we're going to play Russian roulette forever? Mm-hmm. Um, well, I think I think you've really spelled it out. Uh, we haven't seen any candidate, uh, major or minor, in Nigeria uh, articulate a case for um, articulate a prescription for how to revive this comatose space that we call Nigeria. And so the task of saving, redeeming, uh, you know, um, reviving this patient uh, falls on all Nigerians. And I think that is um, uh, an urgent, critical, emergency, t- emergency task which we must undertake before we uh, should think about this, uh, the luxury of another set of elections, which, you know, as we, you know, elections are very, very costly in Nigeria, costly in terms of finance, which we don't have, and often costly in terms of the number of poor, innocent Nigerians, some of them who hire themselves out, out of desperation as as thugs and so on, and uh, they end up killing uh, other people or getting killed. Um, so, could I uh, could I add yes. to that? There was a picture, Tinubu's son. Yes, um, I've forgotten his name. 
Tinubu's son put out on Twitter that he took down. And it was about strategizing for the elections. And on the backboard, they wrote what they were, their strategy was. And that's why he took it down, because the strategy was um, violence, he, that they, they wrote down inducement. Right. Yeah, <laughs> inducement. But yeah, inducement. Like they literally. I mean, they didn't spell out violence, but yeah. it was like this. They literally. They, like, they will like, induce you with money or induce you with violence. Yeah, the they, of violence. They literally to put it do, to do the right thing. <laughs> so, uh, so, so yeah, we. It's it's um, guys. Nigeria doesn't exist. You know, I, I, I'm sorry to be, be the bearer of bad news, but I'm sure that if you sit for a moment and you contemplate it, you'll come to that same conclusion. The country we call Nigeria is fiction. It doesn't exist. So if you care to revive the country, we have to all do that work, right? And we have to say, what kind of entity do we have the new Nigeria to have? Do we even have the... Uh, inclination to coexist and if we do under what conditions and how can we set up foundations in education in healthcare and in infrastructure in our politics constitutionally to give uh, an overarching uh, sound and inspiring constitution to hold everything together law and order the judiciary the executive the legislature you know uh, what does the Nigerian space mean? What values animate that space? So these are questions that Nigerians have to grapple with before they go into another wasteful, just wasteful, and ultimately futile election. Well, it's been a very spirited conversation today, I think, uh, in this particular es episode. I've enjoyed it a lot, even though I started it not knowing whether I should cry or laugh Very true. at the idea of Buhari going to Liberia to talk about security. But any last words before? Um, I mean, it's always great to um, have those. Um, I keep putting it out there. Um, as it's good to see that um, young people, especially young especially, people, yeah, they've transferred. They are they are transferring. They are this thing, you know, from. The ASU strike, to, uh, from the NSAS, ASU strike, a lot of them are the, on the, the PTLB. This thing is, is good to see the level of political activeness. Yes. That everybody's tired. Um, question is just, obviously, week to week, month to month, what's going to happen? Yes. So thank you very much uh, to all our listeners for joining us on this particular episode, and we look forward to welcoming you again during another episode. Have a brilliant rest of the week. Thank you.